Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed colleagues and uh, honored guests, both uh, here in the room joining us virtually, welcome to our 10th anniversary celebration of the General Sun uh, journey of uh, an Israeli in Palestine. Uh, my name is Saeed Erekat. I'm a proud member of the Palestine Center Committee. It is uh, both uh, an honor and a privilege to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker today. We're thrilled to welcome Miko Pelled, a prominent writer and a human rights activist. Miko was born and raised in Jerusalem, so we share the same birthplace. And uh, his uh, compelling voice has been instrumental in advocating for justice in Palestine, supporting the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS, uh, you should join, and uh, endorsing the creation of a single democracy with equal rights throughout uh, historic Palestine. Following a personal family tragedy, Miko embarked on a, an exploration of Palestine, its people, and their narrative. His journey culminated in the book, The General's Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. Endorsed by influential figures such as Alice Walker, Ralph Nader, Seymour Hirsch, and Naomi Wolf, The General's Son has emerged as a significant resource in the discourse on the Palestinian issue. It is uh, valued not only for telling the story of uh, Miko's personal uh, transformation, which uh, we will learn about tonight, but also for his contribution to the debate uh, examining the circumstances of the 1967 war, also known as the Six Day War. This war, which resulted in Israel's uh, conquest of Arab and Palestinian land, continues to significantly shape the regional and geographical landscape. In 2016, uh, Miko published his second book, Injustice, the Story of the Holy Land Foundation uh, 5. Uh, this work reveals the uh, unwarranted closure of America's largest uh, Muslim charity, the Holy, Land, uh, the Holy Land Foundation, and the unjust trials and convictions of five innocent uh, Palestinian Muslim Americans. Uh, Pile de uh, Miko uh, skillfully unveils a decade-long campaign to criminalize humanitarian aid to impoverished Palestinians and expose how the U.S. criminal justice system has failed to uphold uh, its ideals. In addition to his book, uh, Miko contributes uh, to Mint Press uh, News and authors a blog, uh, podcast, and uh, uh, Patreon space dedicated to it, the, tearing down the separation wall and advocating the right of return and the creation of one democratic state with equal rights. A regular, a regular visitor to the Palestine Center, I see him here uh, all the time. Uh, Miko's activism has led to several encounters with Israeli authorities. You know, uh, it trained uh, in Jerusalem and Japan and the United States. Uh, Miko. It was a professional martial artist, you know, scary kind of guy, you know, holding a six degree black belt in karate. For 23 years, he ran a martial arts school, uh, promoting leadership skills and peaceful conflict resolution. In 2012, uh, Miko shifted his focus entirely to writing uh, public speaking and activism with the aim of transforming the, the Zionist regime in Palestine into a democracy with equal rights. Uh, before we begin uh, our discussion, I'd like to uh, address a few housekeeping uh, rules. Uh, Miko will first uh, present a short video, followed by his talk. Uh, I will then moderate a Q&A. And, &A. and uh, uh, for those uh, of you participating online via Facebook or YouTube, please uh, post your questions for Miko in the comment section, and we will uh, address them. If you are interested in acquiring a book of the Journal of Sun, there is copies here. Okay, and uh, of course, you know, silence your phones. So now without uh, further ado, I want to introduce Miko. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me back to uh, the Palestine Center. I was here 10 years ago when the book came out. This is one of my first presentations. And it's a great pleasure and a great honor to uh, come and speak uh, speak here again. And thank you all for taking the time this evening to be here and the people watching um, the live stream as well. So what I'd like to do 
Um, actually, what I'd like to do is I'd like to acknowledge uh, my teacher and one of the founders of this place, Dr. Shukri Abid, who is here in the audience. Thank you for coming, Dr. Shukri. Like I said, he's been trying to teach me Arabic for more than 10 years now, and it's been an honor and a pleasure. Um, so what I'd like, uh, in kind of in recognition of the 10th anniversary of the book, we embarked on a project uh, to um, put together a documentary. And the documentary more or less follows the storyline of the book uh, with some diversions. And it's a labor of love. And of course, anything that has to do with Palestine, there's always another little bit here and another little bit there. So it's taking a little bit longer than we expected. But we do have about a seven minute clip um, that I want to show you today before, before I start my remarks. So um, we'll do that first. But I'm not sure. You got it? Okay, thanks. The lights and everything. Thank you. We talked a lot. We talked for many hours. I was come here Thursday, and we talk all day, and then go to the protest. And all the time we have a new idea. Awesome. What? Do you remember the first time you met Miko? Yeah. He was in the beginning of his journey in the West Bank involved in the normalization project. So we start talking and he want to come and visit. It's not easy for me to accept Israeli in that time. The only image of my mind on, for the Israeli in that time, just the soldiers who are shooting. Or the jailer who closed the, the, the door on my face. Shabak officer who tortured me and the settler who killed my sister. This is the Israeli. In that day, we have the demonstration. The people throwing the stones, biggest stones, the smallest stones. And we start talking about the stone. I told him when we are walking on the, the fields and we feel any danger, snake, wolf, dog, something like that, we directly go to the ground and take a stone. It's protection, not attacking. This is a big snake, this soldier and this jeeps. We are directly going to protect ourselves by the stone. I never saw people standing like Nabi Saleh without apology. If you come here, you accept the struggle. But how can I accept you, the Israeli? It's hard journey in my head. For me, it is the same. For that, we become part. I had never met Palestinians before. I mean, I saw Palestinians growing up as an Israeli. You see Palestinians. They do the landscape in the garden. They, um, they collect the trash. Right? So you hear them speak Arabic. All the construction sites, you know, all the laborers are Palestinians. Because of my father's work, I met one or two Palestinian politicians a couple of times. But overall, no. I mean, we live, Israelis live in, in, in a sphere where Palestinians don't exist. They walk through, they go in and out of the, of the frame, but they don't really exist within the frame. 
there was no reason uh, to meet Palestinians. And this is, even though I lived in, you know, in Jerusalem, my entire growing up was in Jerusalem. The roads were always paved and beautiful. There was always well lit. There was always running water as much as I wanted. It was very safe. And the journey that I took was from that very safe and very comfortable place, place of privilege, to the sphere of the other, the sphere of the occupied. And in taking that journey, I discovered what Palestine is and what it means to be an Israeli. was known as one of the richest villages in, in the area of Jerusalem. It was populated from the seventh century till April 9th, 1948. When you visit the location and you see about 70 empty Palestinian houses, the feeling of the ghosts, of the Palestinian life, it's very, very powerful. I'm uh, Omar al Ghubari. I'm uh, a Palestinian from a small village south to Nazareth. My village was attacked also in 1948, and all the families forced to leave the village uh, because of that attack. Now I work for Zohrot, uh, NGO based in uh, Tel Aviv. Zohrot is a word in Hebrew, means remembering. Hundreds of Palestinian villages were destroyed in the first years of the country. Israeli authorities tried to hide this history and these facts from the public, including the Israelis. I've been here dozens of times, and every time it's painful, I cannot imagine how really people can do this, these things. Marhaba. أنا مع كيفك شو أخبارك؟ كيفك؟ أهلاً مبارك أهلاً كيف حالك؟ الحمد لله زمان الحمد لله الحمد لله مرحبا منال كيفك؟ شو أخبارك؟ أهلاً 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 الحمد لله This is uh, amazing that you have all of these protests all recorded all recorded all Yeah recorded. it's good that they're yes. still on YouTube It's really important We still have many hours Seven years every Friday. Here uh, in the village, we began to do nonviolent protest, singing, chanting, holding flags, Friday after Friday. It's a way of nonviolent mm -hmm. resistance. What we are doing is just expressing a desire to live. We are here and we have a right to be here. I'm a mother. I'm a woman, I'm an activist, I'm a Palestinian, which is, I think, it's the most difficult things to have in one person. I believe that I have to keep fighting, I have to keep resisting. This is what I'm trying to teach my children. 
despite but stay human, which is very difficult to do, to talk with them about love while they are facing hatred every day. They are just children. It's not normal to talk with 10 years old child about his right under incubation. I hope that one day all this pain and all this suffering, all this abnormality will come to an end and they will be able to, to live their normal life. But till that time, they have to keep fighting. They have to keep resisting. They have to never give up. Otherwise, they gonna lose everything. So this is, uh, the, the entire movie is almost complete, but we just, you know, what we have to display is the seven minute clip. And like I said, it, it pretty much follows the story of the storyline of the general son, but obviously with update, uh, updates because, you know, things are, things are evolving and moving all the time. So the Shada village in Abisal, I'm sure you've all heard a couple of weeks ago, a two-year-old was murdered there. And um, I'm kind of off off uh, track just just to say a couple of words about that. And uh, I've been to Nabi Saleh, I don't know how many times. It's al it's almost my like my second home, and these people are like my family. And um, one of the claims that was made by the Israelis in the case of the shooting of this little boy was that the Israeli soldiers thought that they were shooting somebody and it was a mistake and. They thought that there was some somebody shooting from the around where the house is. And, and the truth is, the house where that boy lived is not far from the actual uh, entrance to the village where there's a, there's a gate. And they want the house. And they've been wanting the house for a very long time. They want to get rid of them. And when the soldiers shoot, and I've seen this, I don't know how many times in protests and, 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 and raids into the village. When the soldiers shoot, it's always a sniper. So they go down on their knee and they look through the site and they know and they see exactly what they're shooting. So there was no question. Similar with uh, Shirin Abu Akli. There was no question they knew exactly who they were shooting. So it's very, very painful. And then during the funeral, the family was attacked as well. It's a long story in Palestine always. And I think it's important also to uh, mention today Janine, who stood up a couple of days ago heroically the people of Janine fight heroically and with great valor against this massive war machine, which is the state of Israel. So I think it's important to you know remember them right now. Um, I think Israel has a, I think a lot of the attacks on Janine have to do with vengeance because they always exact a heavy price from the Israeli forces. And the whole operation in Janine began because the Israelis were trying to catch two fighters, two fighters. So the night before they had a covert operation that was botched. There was an undercover unit in the refugee camp that was discovered by the Palestinians. So then they brought in the backup, two brigades of special forces. That's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers and the uh, Apache helicopters. And never, not even to mention the whole logistics of op the logistical operation behind the scenes. We're talking about probably thousands of soldiers, millions of dollars to capture two guys who probably all they have. And I mean, the Palestinian fighters, what do they have? They have a machine gun and a handful of bullets. They don't have this massive military operation. So I think, you know, it, it kind of it, it puts things in perspective. And of course, now in Hawara again, there's a there's another there's another uh, raid by settlers into Hawara, and they are standing up. You know, God bless them. So it's just important to raise these things because they're happening as we speak. But back to the book, the general son. 
So I think th there are several things that I feel are uh, unique about the story that I tell. And one of them, and the reason they're unique is because I happen to grow up in this environment where um, the people around me were decision makers and people who were you know, actors in the creation of the state of Israel. So the conversations I was listening to and the people that were around me all the time growing up were people that held major positions either before the state or after the state or sometimes both. And of course, the key figure in my life was my father, who was who was um, the general, you know, the general's son. So he was the general and he was a general in 1967, which, of course, um, uh, during the Naksa, which, of course, is, is very significant. In Israeli lore, the generals of 1967 are the gods of the Olympus. They did the impossible. And I'll talk about that um, in just a little bit. But. What, what what I find interesting, and again, what makes it unique, is that there are certain aspects of the story of Palestine, and certain aspects of the colonization of Palestine by Israel by the by the Zionists, that are somehow either overlooked or somebody or or are not known. And I just happened to be there where I saw or heard or read something um, that I remember, and and I put that in the book. One of these things. Uh, is a story that I read in a memoir by Moshe Sharet. Moshe Sharet was Israel's second prime minister. He's like Israel's John Adams. He is the uh, the politician that was forgotten because he stood in the way of somebody else. And so he was the foreign minister. He was diplomat. He was he was a key figure in the pre-state diplomacy of the Zionist movement. And um, he was foreign minister for a short time, and then he was kicked out because he was, he was considered too moderate. But, and he was also a very close friend of my grandfather. And his son is dedicated to, has been dedicated for almost 15 years, I think, in putting out every word that he wrote, every meeting that he was in. So his, his son, uh, his name is Yaakov, who is the same age as my mother, so he's 96, and his wife sit in their apartment in Tel Aviv all day long, transcribing every minute of every, every, the minutes of every meeting, pre-state, after the state was established, and his own diaries. And so he's been sending me his, his, it's all in Hebrew, so he's been sending these massive volumes, and they're fascinating. And then I'm reading through his memoir, and he's describing... Um, a visit in 1952 of major Jewish American leaders in Jerusalem. And uh, Ben Gurion was there, who was Israel's first prime minister, and Sharet was there. And he said that the speaker was this young, uh, well spoken young officer, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel by the name of Mati Pellet, who was my father. And he says, and it's, <laughs> I was checking today, it's, it's actually. I transcribed it, I, trans, I mean, translated and transcribed it. It's on page 48. And there's just a few lines where he says that this lieutenant, young lieutenant colonel said that the military, the Israeli army is ready for war. And they are prepared, they are prepared, constantly prepared for the, for the day that the government will give the order, listen to this, will give the order to push Israel's eastern border all the way to the Jordan River where it belongs. This is, you know, this is talking about taking the West Bank. 1952. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I found all these little points throughout the story that create a picture which negate the, you know, the accepted narrative of 1967. And of course, the accepted narrative is that Israel had to engage in a preemptive strike because there was an existential threat. And then by some incredible, you know, act of who knows what, inter heavenly intervention, they managed to defeat all these Arab, massive Arab armies and capture all of this land and so forth. And so I think these little stories will hopefully dispel and 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 demonstrate a complete a very different story, which I think is is the real story. So this little story of 1952 
of a speech that my father happened to have given and Moshe Sharet happened to have just, you know, put it in his diary, in his memoir, is, is one such thing. Then, um, this is not that well known either, but throughout the early 1960s, Israel was really pushing very hard to engage in a war with Syria to take the Golan Heights. And they would have all these military incursions and they would take land because they really wanted the Golan Heights. I mean, it's beautiful, it's fertile, fertile land, it's full of water and so on. And there was, there was a full expectation that Israel was going to do that. And once they do that, they're probably, they're also going to take, you know, the rest of the land of Israel, which is again, pushing the Israeli, the Eastern boundary to the Jordan River, taking the West Bank. And they had, they already had a model for the occupation because the Palestinians of 1948, during that time, during the 50s until the mid 60s, the past the mid 60s, uh, were under uh, living under occupation, under military rule. So, in some ways, people are saying it's not that the the apartheid of the West Bank had come to Palestine of 1948, but the other way around. They took the apartheid they already created. And they're establishing that in the West Bank. So this is going on throughout the 1960s. Now, here's something really interesting. Has anybody here ever heard of the, uh, the song, Jerusalem of Gold? No, not even the Jewish people here. Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, right. So Jerusalem of Gold, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav became an iconic song by Israel's most favorite songwriter, a very nationalist songwriter, Naomi Shemer. And the story of the song tells a lot about the intentions and what happened the months leading up to the 1967 war. And by the way, I think calling it a war is wrong. I don't think it was a war. I think it was a, an unwarranted, brutal assault by Israel against its neighbors. It wasn't a war. But again, I'll get into some of the details later. So where did the song come from, Jerusalem of Gold? It's got some very interesting lines in it. Uh, on May 15th, 1967, May 15th is when Israel celebrates its uh, Independence Day. May 15th, 1967, the mayor of Jerusalem decided to, uh, he contacted Naomi Shemer, the songwriter, and commissioned a song about Jerusalem. And so she wrote this song. And in this song, there are several lines about the old city, because Jerusalem, of course, the yearning for the old city. They took this, what was a religious yearning, a yearning of people to worship or to engage in the holiness, in other words, a very religious experience into a nationalistic experience, a completely secular nationalistic experience, because Israelis were mostly secular. And in this, in this, uh, in this song, <clears throat> Some of the lines talk about how um, the city plazas are empty, the markets are barren, the water wells are dried up, no one prays on the Temple Mount, no one you know, ascends the Temple Mount. In other words, a city that is empty, a ghost town, basically. This is two weeks or maybe a month, not a month, two, three weeks before the war before the engagement, you know, before the Israel attacks. So this is the first time this song is, is, is heard and it catches on like wildfire. All Israeli radio, I remember as, as a kid when it came out, everybody had the little, the little records, the 45s, all the radio stations were, were playing it all the time. The soldiers were singing it. It, would, it was like a national anthem. It was bigger than that. It was a big deal. During this time, the Israeli high command, of which my father was a member, was pushing very, very hard to start the war. And there was this very interesting uh, kind of clash that I describe in the book between these young, you know, arrogant, confident generals. They're all in their 40s, which is very, very young for generals. Um, they all fought in 1948 and they won. Then there was a 56 uh, campaign, Suez Canal, uh, so the Suez campaign, and they won. And there were all these battles and, you know, attacks, and they always won, and they were strong, and they felt like undefeatable. And there was the Israeli cabinet 
they were made of these older Jews in their 60s and 70s, Jews who came from, you know, from the diaspora. They were scared. They didn't really want, they weren't sure about, you know, starting another war. And there was this clash. And so in order to do what needed to be done, in their opinion, they were pushing the government very hard, but they needed a public opinion. So the song, I believe, is part of that public opinion campaign. On top of that, there was a sense of fear. And I remember these stories. I remember people talking about this, the grown-ups talking about, you know, how if the Arabs come, they're gonna, the Arabs are planning to come and kill us all. The Arabs are on their way to come and kill and slaughter all of us. The word slaughter, not just kill. I remember the word slaughter. And I happen to live outside Jerusalem, not far from where, you, anybody here know who Abdul Qadir Husseini was? Abdul Qadir Husseini was a legendary Palestinian leader who was killed on the outskirts of Jerusalem in 1948. And, he, and we lived just down the hill from there. So the story was that now they're going to come and avenge his death by slaughtering all of us. In other words, there was this image of this enormous, powerful military coming to get us. And what do we have? A small state with a small little army and these, you know, these brave generals and a few young soldiers who are going to save us, hopefully. This was the sentiment that was being pushed, a sense that, that there was doom impending, that there was, and this is really when the phrase was coined, an existential threat, an existential threat. May 28, there was a, the, there was a meeting of the, the, the Israeli high command with the, with the Israeli prime minister. June 2nd, another meeting, very vocal. Now, it's interesting. The meetings were held at the army headquarters, which is, by the way, right in central Tel Aviv. You know, they talk about how they sometimes accuse like Hamas or other organized, or other Palestinians of, of having their bases in the in civilian centers, centers where heavy populated civilians. Well, the headquarters of the Israeli army is in central downtown Tel Aviv. Just a side note. But anyway. The prime minister came to them. The prime minister came to them. This says a lot. It's a very symbolic thing. This old Jew, this old prime minister came to these young, you know, Maccabees, so to speak. This, this, this dynamic between these generations is really, really important. And they were pushing very hard. And my father became known. I remember my whole life hearing from other people how at these meetings, my father stood up and he demanded and he said this and he said, and basically they were telling the prime minister to get the hell out of the way. They want the war. When I was working on the book, it was suggested to me to go into the Israeli army archives to learn about my father's uh, career. And I did that and I spent several days in the army archives. And I found something that I hadn't seen anywhere else. I, you know, I read Ilan Pape, who was a good friend. I read so many, every, everything that's out there. And this particular point, I saw nowhere before or actually since. The minutes of the meetings of the generals and these two important meetings, May 28 and June 2nd, 1967, are all there. They're available. Anybody can read them. General this said this, general that said that, general this said this, the prime minister said this, you know, it's all in the mean, minutes. Not a single time did they utter the word threat. Not once. The word threat does not come up in their minutes, in their meetings at all. Instead, what is the word that is that comes up all the time? Opportunity. Opportunity. And what is the opportunity? And my father happened to be the one who says this. He says, the Arab armies are not prepared for war. Therefore, we have an opportunity now to attack and win. The Egyptian army, which is, of course, the largest army at the time, and was considered the big threat with, you know, Gamal Abdel Nasser as the big, you know, evil, uh, evil man. My father says, because the Egyptian army had just come back from Yemen. They were fighting a, a war in Yemen, which a lot of people, of course, don't remember. He said, the Egyptian army is going to need at least another year and a half or two years before it's ready for war. This is the time to attack. So this whole idea that there was Israel was somehow under some kind of a threat is a complete lie. It's a complete falsehood that was perpetrated by these generals who wanted nothing more than another war and another victory. They wanted another victory. That's all. 
and of course the spoils that come with the victory. The Israeli army throughout the 1960s was well trained, well prepared, well oiled fighting machine, a war machine. There was no, not even a shred of a doubt that they were going to be victorious. There was not a shred of a doubt that they were going to decimate any army that stood in their way. Now they're also very motivated. These were young zealots who were leading this military force. So the war begins and ends in five days, five days. So why is it called the Six-Day War? Where did the Sixth Day come from? If you look at the Jewish scriptures, if you look at the Jewish prayer book, which I've been doing a lot lately, not because I found religion, but because I'm working on a book about that is related to that. I can talk about that later. You see the reference to the six days of creation a lot. The miracle of the six days. It shows up. And I'm sitting there with all these ultra-Orthodox Jews. I'm writing a book about the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. And, you know, these are the most observant, strict Jewish people on earth. And they're reading this. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, every time up, every time I see the term six days, it pops out, out of the text. It's like it literally pops out at me. Six days, six days, six days, six days. This is why they called it a six-day war. They wanted people to think there was some kind of, you know, heavenly intervention, that there was a miracle. And I spend a lot of time with the ultra-Orthodox community now, and they ask me if it's true that even secular Jews think that this was a miracle, that even secular Israelis think it's a miracle. And I did an interview recently with Phil, Va Phil Weiss of Manda Weiss. Um, it's on, you know, it's on my, my podcast and in a few other platforms, we had a great time chatting and we were both just in disbelief that here in America, educated intellectual Jews refer to the 1967 war as a miracle, secular people. What do you mean miracle? How could we be using this term when we are, you know, educated secular people? But somehow, six days, victory, Jerusalem, it just makes everybody suddenly, you know, find God or something. It makes everybody go wacko. And that was precisely why they named it a six-day war. Now, something very interesting happened in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Remember the story? Can I have some water, please? Do you mind? Thanks. Oh, there's some here. Never mind. <clears throat> Something very interesting happens. I remember the story about the song, the Jerusalem of Gold. Now, I remember, I remember as a little boy growing up, a completely secular, completely secular. I opened the prayer book. I don't have no idea what I'm looking at. Singing songs about building the temple one day. Building the temple one day on the Temple Mount, which, of course, is Alexa. And today I look back and I'm thinking, what? As a secular person, why was, why was somebody teaching me these songs about building a temple? To sacrifice? To do what? But what they did was they took this religious sentiment. They took this article of faith that has nothing to do with occupation, sovereignty, war. And turned it into a national symbol. So... Jerusalem is taken, the old city of Jerusalem is taken by the paratroopers. And the commander of the paratroopers who was there with them goes up on al -Aqsa and he says in the radio, and if you ask any Israeli today, what is the most iconic sentence they remember, not remember, or know about the 1967 war? This is it. This is it. He says, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Harabayit biadenu. Who cares? They took all of Sinai. It's what is it, three times or two and a half times size of the size of, of historic Palestine. 
That was not the big deal. Harabite, the Temple Mount. Why? He was secular. We were secular. Who cares about the Temple Mount? No. And this is the most iconic sentence. Even young people, of course, who were not, were not even born then. Politicians today who are fighting over the taking of Al-Aqsa by, you know, by Israeli settlers. They use this line all the time. The Temple Mount is either in our hands or it's not in our hands. The Temple Mount is in our hands and so on and so on. This is an iconic, iconic sentence. Again, to show where this came from and how it was moving forward. Nothing to do with a threat. Interestingly enough, after the war, I don't know, maybe two weeks or something, Naomi Shemer, who wrote the, the song, Jerusalem of Gold, goes back and adds another stanza. And what does the new stanza say? The water wells are flowing with water now. The marketplaces are overcrowded again. And prayer is taking place on the Temple Mound once again. In other words, the existence of thousands and millions of Palestinians who are frequenting Jerusalem was nothing. And she was interviewed about this and questioned about this shortly afterwards. And she said, yes, if there are no Jews, it's like there's nobody there to me. She admitted this. And again, she was as far away from being a religious person as you can imagine, but she was a fascist, an absolute fascist. We knew her personally. She, anyway, long story, but we knew her personally. They're family friends. It's amazing how many fascist friends I had, or my family had growing up. <clears throat> That's kind of a later revelation. We know that the Golan Heights, it was an, a campaign of ethnic cleansing. Over 100,000 Syrians were thrown out of the Golan Heights. A story that some people know, but I know, and some people discuss is maybe or maybe not. I know it for a fact because I heard it from people who were there. Thousands of POWs were shot and murdered and buried in the dunes in the Sinai by Israeli soldiers. Thousands of POWs, Egyptian soldiers that were captured, were murdered and buried right there in the Sinai in the dunes. And you may remember the horror of the pictures that we saw after Abu Ghraib. That was nothing. The pictures that were taken by soldiers. And I know this only because as a young boy, I knew young men who were soldiers there, who were who fought. And of course, we thought, man, these young Israeli fighters, these young Israeli tank commanders. Thousands, not a few 10 or 20 or 100, not that that you know, is, is okay. Thousands were sprayed and allowed to die and buried with bulldozers. A miracle? And all of this happened in six days. 18,000 Arab soldiers were killed. 18,000 Arab soldiers were killed in five days. 700 Israeli soldiers were killed during that time. Now, every soldier has a mother and a father, so, you know, it's a sad story. But the difference tells us who was uh, under threat and who was not. This was not a war. This was a brutal, cruel, unwarranted assault by war-mongering, war-hungry generals. That's what this was unjustified, inexcusable, unwarranted, by any standard. They knew they were going to win. It gave an opportunity, them an opportunity to show themselves, to shine. And again, the whole world thinks that these guys are military geniuses. What's the genius when you're fighting an army that you know can't win? Where's the heroism? Where's the heroism when you send thousands of troops into Janine to capture two guys, where's the heroism? This is the story of Israel. This is the story of the Israeli army. The myth about heroism, the myth about a moral army, 
the myth about some poor little country defending itself is a lie. And it's been, it's, it took hold and it's almost impossible to get rid of it because people love it so much. Israel, Jerusalem, Bible, a miracle. What the hell are you talking about? None of the Arab countries had, of course, armies had a chance. Of course it was a victory. If you can call that a victory. If you can call a slaughter like that, a massive assault like that, a victory. And the Naqsa, the taking of the West Bank, of the Romain, or as they call it, finishing the job. That's what they called it, finishing the job. What my father said in 1952, they did in 1967. Took a, it took a few more years than maybe they were expecting. You know, 500,000 Palestinians displaced. Who knows how many were killed? Who knows how many were massacred? Who knows how many were wounded? Chaos. I know people who are children, stories about the chaos trying to escape. But here's an interesting story. Another interesting story, but I think more interesting than the others. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm working on a book now about the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community because they are inherently an anti-Zionist community. They always have been. Some more extreme, some more vocal, some less, but basically an anti-Zionist community. And, I can't, and many of you may have seen in protests here in DC and in New York, they show up, these rabbis show up with Palestinian flags. You think you, 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 you drank too much or something too last night or something. It was absurd, right? So I become quite acquainted with this community. I've been up there. I spend days there. I spend nights at people's homes and so on. And there was a very revered old, old rabbi called Rabbi Beck. And Rabbi Beck, he used to come to the protests. He always wore a white coat, overcoat with blue stripes. That's the coat that only the Jerusalemite Orthodox Jews get to wear. It distinguishes them as Jerusalemites. He survived Auschwitz as a boy. You know, went back and forth as all the, you know, Holocaust survivor refugees did. And he ended up in Jerusalem. And he was a luminary. He was, a you know, a, a genius. Yeshiva, you know, Talmudic genius. He married into a very respectable J Jerusalemite family. You know, family with roots that go, rabbis that go back generations and so forth. Now, the ultra-Orthodox community in Jerusalem, the neighborhood, Meisharim, some of you may know it. If you know Jerusalem, it's right on the border between East and West Jerusalem, called Meisharim. It's a very old uh, neighborhood. It was built in the 19th century when Jews just, you know, the old city was too small and they needed. So some philanthropist built a neighborhood for them. It's very crowded and it's a very interesting place. But anyway, that's where he lived. And there, so there was a lot of fighting going on along that border. And there was a particular battle called in an area uh, called Ammunition Hill. And there, anyway, they were in a, in a bomb shelter. Him and all of his children. And you know, these people have many children. So they're sitting there in the bomb shelter and they heard, they heard uh, planes dropping bombs and people were scared. And somebody in the bomb shelter said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. These are ours. These are our guys. And at that moment, Rabbi Beck said, I cannot stay in this country any longer. For a Jew to associate themselves with the Israeli army is tantamount to, 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 to it's sinful. It's sacrilege. And as soon as he could, he took his children, his wife, and a few other young rabbis, got up and left. He said, I will not raise my children in a country where Jews have a sense of affiliation with a military force, with the Israeli army. And he left. He lived in England for a while, then he was up in Muncie, New York, 
And if you notice that a lot of the protests, you see the younger people, and then you see this older rabbi sitting, you know, he's sitting because he was so old. And then sadly, he died of COVID. He survived all of that, and he was in his 90s, and he died of COVID. And his son is a rabbi in London, very well known. Anyway, so this is another side of the story that's also not known, you know, because the, the, the sense that this rabbi had was that this entire operation, this entire Zionist expedition, this entire experiment is, is heretic. It's heresy. And therefore he wanted to nothing, uh, nothing to do with it. So I don't know how, how to stress it enough, but I think we cannot overemphasize how important it is to rip up the myth, to rip up this narrative, because it continues today. It continues today. Why is America giving Israel billions of dollars every year? Why? They call it foreign aid. Well, the foreign aid began in the, in the 70s. By then, Israel occupied all of, pa all of Palestine, won all these wars, had an economy, built a state. They were never in need. Aid, aid, when you say aid, you think, oh, somebody's in need. In need of what? They were never in, they were not in need in everything, in anything. Why are billions of dollars being given? And the, re the, the reason I think it's possible, the reason American politicians, elected officials who are actually entrusted with our tax dollars, are giving it away to Israel like this is because they can still maintain this lie, this narrative. It begins in 1948 when, you know, the poor Jews, the poor Holocaust survivors began the state, which of course is not true. Very few Holocaust survivors actually went to, what, to Palestine. The vast majority did not go to Palestine. So that's a lie. Israel is not a state of survivors of the Holocaust, not not by any stretch of the imagination. And then, you know, the 1967, the miracle. And now once again, you know, this poor Israel that is living with all these, with all these countries that want to destroy it. So we have to give them aid. Israel doesn't need aid. So again, in order to, the, 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 the fact that this lie continues to be perpetuated like this is allowing you know, it's like a vicious circle. I don't know if you saw, but of course, yesterday, or was it today, a Palestinian went in and shot a few settlers in one of the settlements in the West Bank. And all the ambassadors and the American ambassador in Tel Aviv and everyone, you know, oh my God, you know, we feel so terrible. For so but why are you arming Israel? Why? Why are you arming a country that is genocidal? Why are you arming an army, a, a, a state that has been accused by Amnesty International of the crime of apartheid, a crime that is so heinous it's designated as a crime against humanity. And it's interesting, when, were the, when, was the, the, this, when does this designation of crimes against humanity, when was it created? After the genocide of the Jews by the Nazis. And three years later, an apartheid regime by a state that pretends to be representing these Jews is established in Palestine. Are we out of our minds? And if you look at the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League website, it's wrong to accuse, it's wrong to accuse American Jews who support Zionism of racism. We need to be tolerant of that. If you accuse them, then you're anti-Semitic, then you're the problem. I mean, this is so twisted. This is so absolutely incredibly twisted. Why is this country being armed? Why is this country being given so much money that it doesn't need? And the only people who can actually ask these questions and answer these questions are us. We're paying the taxes. It's our representatives that we vote for, these representatives that we vote for every single, you know, every single election. Why are we allowing it? Why are we allowing a, a, a politician to associate themselves with Zionism? What's next? What's next? What other racist ideology are we going to allow them to associate themselves with? You know, it's really on us. It's up to us. I don't want to take too much time. I'm, we're going to do a little Q&A in a minute. But I do want to say this. I think that 
There's this expectation that somebody will come or somebody will, will be elected or somebody will bring change. It's that person is us. That person is sitting in, the, in this room. And in rooms like this, as I, you know, I go up and down the country and overseas talking to people, this is the people, this is who's going to be the change. If we do it, sure, it'll come. If we sit around and wait, it'll never come. The city of Hebron is apartheid in a lab. It's apartheid in a laboratory. You know, if ever you want to have a, you go to see the apartheid museum. Shukri, Dr. Shukri and I went there before. You know, it's an apartheid museum. But nobody's heard of Hebron. Nobody cares of Hebron. It's way out there in, I don't know, in the West Bank or whatever. Nobody goes there. Jerusalem is now next. The Hebronization of Jerusalem, the Hebronization of the Old City, the Hebronization of Al-Aqsa. They're already talking about splicing Al-Aqsa. They're already talking about taking one of the mosques in Al-Aqsa and creating a synagogue for the settlers. I've been to three tours already on Al-Aqsa with the settlers. I can't, I, I don't even have, I can't, you know, I speak and write for a living. I can't even find the words to describe these people. These mad, hate-filled, racist lunatics. But there's so many of them that it's almost like it's, it's, there's nothing strange about them. You know? So this is now happening in Jerusalem. It's happening in other parts of Palestine, of course, but nobody's heard of the Naqab. Nobody cares about the Galilee. Nobody has heard of Yaffa and Lid, and nobody cares about those places because they're not in the headlines. But these are things that are happening every single day in every part of Palestine. And unless here in Washington, D.C., we are able to say enough and put a stop to it, it's never going to stop. It's never going to stop on its own. So I want to, you know, on the one hand, it's really hard to be optimistic because things are going so wrong so fast. On the other hand, we don't have that luxury to be pessimistic. You know, we're rich, we're free, we're alive. We don't have that luxury. If uh, people in Abi Saleh are fighting and people in Jenin, a bunch of guys with, the, you know, jeans and a t-shirt and a machine gun are fighting this massive Israeli army and people in Gaza are sending their kids to school every day and, you know, making sure that their uniform is good and their hair is nice and neat and their shirts are ironed, then, you know, we have no, 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 no place to, 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 have, to be, you know, to be hopeless. But it's not, it's it's not going to change until we do. And I think what we need to do is really clarify, and I'll end with this, when we say free Palestine, what does that mean? It has to be more than a t-shirt. It has to be more than a bumper sticker. You walk by a dying person and you say, hey man, I'm with you. And you walk away, they're gonna die. They need intervention. They need not solidarity. They need us to be involved. Whether they're in Janine fighting, whether in the Naqab fighting in other ways, you know, demonstrating and using unarmed uh, resistance or in Hebron or anywhere else, they need to know we are with them 110% all the time. And then we need to act over here to make sure that they're safe. Because Palestinians are not safe. They're not safe. Anywhere in Palestine, there's not a single place in Palestine the Palestinians are safe. No one talks about guarantees for the safety and security of Palestinians. So it's incumbent upon us. But again, what is a free Palestine? Well, we know what free is. It means no racist laws, no checkpoints, no military, no apartheid. Palestine, the borders, I think, are quite clear. The Jordan River in the east, the, the Mediterranean in the west, the boundaries of, with the Lebanon and Syria in the north, and the Gulf of Aqaba in the south. Look at any map up to, 19, up to May 15, 1948. Look at any map leading up to that day. That stretch of land is called Palestine. So we know what free means. We know what Palestine means. Now we just need to do it. And the sooner we get up, the sooner we do it, the sooner it'll happen. And when it does happen, then I think we're all going to feel pretty good about ourselves knowing that we had something to do 
with making that a reality. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you. Nico. I mean, you spoke very well, spoke long, but I think it was uh, well received by everybody. You uh, sort of opened a window to all of us to see what was really happening during and thereafter, uh, during the creation of the state of Israel, during that brief period of time. Your dad was there planning, you know, finishing the job and, and so on, as you, as you pointed out. And uh, you said a great deal. You also uh, gave us uh, sort of a, a, a window or, you know, maybe a thumbnail uh, of uh, uh, how they view uh, Arabs and Palestinians and so on. You know, I was struck by what you said uh, about how we don't even know that they are there, who are the Palestinians. And it's true. I mean, they, they're the ones that are, you know, they, every Israeli uh, ends up tormenting Palestinians, almost, you know, being a soldier and so on. Uh, everybody joins this, uh, you know, this army. I think it's a gangster army because the state is a gangster state, in my view. You know, every uh, everybody goes, you know, and serves and torments Palestinians. But then, part of the erasure, part of their the intent to erase the Palestinians, because how else would you justify this, you know, monstro monstrosity, monstrosity that is uh, going on? So, you know, that is maybe a point that I will raise with you. You also, I mean, you spoke about religious zealotry, and it's we know that religious zealotry is really goes hand in hand with fascism. I mean, you know, almost uh, everywhere, but particularly in Israel. I mean, you know, without the miracle, you know, for the most secular, you know, for the most lifty kind of uh, Israeli, what, what, how would you justify the creation of the state of Israel without this religious, you know, BS and and so on, you know, that God gave it uh, to the Jews that. And all that. So all these things that come together. I mean, it makes perfect sense what you say about the six day thing, you know, with uh, with the creation and all that. And I don't want to delve into it, but I want to ask you. I mean, you mentioned what is happening now, and especially in Jenin, and uh, uh, it's a you know, it is really a very compelling story that you told how. The Israelis went in to get two guys, and then they end up using all this uh, machinery that is supplied by the United States of America. I mean, you know, we know how snipers work. We know how they somebody spots and somebody snipes and all these things. I spent five years uh, in a war zone, so I know uh, how how uh, it goes. Uh, we know that Shirin Abu Akhle was not only, uh, you know, uh, the Americans, the American security guy, Finzo, General Finzo, the coordinator, uh, said that, you know, it was likely done by an Israeli soldier, but it was not intended. There was no intention. But we know that it was not only intended, it was premeditated and well planned and well executed. My colleague, um, Ali Smoody, who was hit first, you know, he was hit first. It was actually just to measure, you know, where the bullets are going to go. They hit him, he's, you know, uh, he, he works for, well, that's in Al Quds, the, the newspaper, you know, uh, that publishes in East Jerusalem, he was hit in the shoulder, and then they hit uh, Shireen. So, uh, I mean, knowing how the Israelis think, you know, what comes next? I mean, we saw that today there was an eight-hour, whatever the the nine-hour battle of Janine, you know, whatever you want to call it. And this is really it's like you know, it happens every every other month with Janine. What comes next? And what comes next in terms of, uh, you know, more brazen, if you want, just for the lack of better words, of uh, acts by Palestinians. By Palestinians. Right, right. I mean, I, I, to, well, I, you I, know, think, I mean, yeah. you know, what we saw today, look, I mean, it's going to happen. Yeah. The Palestinians are going to hit back. Yeah. You know? So uh, we are really at the cusp of things that, you know, they, in the American, let's say, diplomatic problems, they call it escalation and so on. But what we see, is eruption because it's coming yeah. to a confrontation, especially with uh, such zealotry that is really now the uh, basically the identity 
of the current Israeli government. Yeah. Well, I think that I think there's two parts to that answer. Uh, I think that I think that unless what, what I don't even know how to put this, unless something happens is organized outside of Palestine. And you and I talked a little bit before we started here. Unless there's a real concerted effort out, outside of Palestine to start, um, you know, to start presenting the Palestinian case here in Washington D.C., nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to change. And people here in America have no idea what the hell is going on in Palestine, nor do they care, although they should. But they don't know and they don't care. And, and that's a serious problem. The, our, our reaction is reaction. In other words, our, what we do is we're always reactionary. We're always reacting to something. You know, there's, there's a massacre in Gaza, we go to protest. Um, there's a massive attack in Jenin, we do this. Or somebody goes and kills a settler. I mean, everything is, there's not apparent to the Palestinian question. Palestine is an orphan. There's nobody in charge. There's nobody taking care of it. And so what everything that happens is kind of sporadic. So in the Northern West Bank, we know that there's fighters and they fight. In the Southern West Bank, we know that the ideology is unarmed resistance. And we have people like Isamro and others who are dedicated to that, you know, dedicated their entire lives to that. In the Naqab, there are fantastic activists that we never hear about because Nobody talks about the Naqab, Palestinian Bedouin, who do fantastic, fantastic uh, civil disobedience and unarmed resistance, and armed if they have to, Bedouin. Uh, in Lid, in Ramle, in Yaffa, in the Galilee, of course, in Jerusalem, tremendous people doing fantastic work, but it's not organized. There is no strategy. There is no parent to the Pal to Palestine. Mm -hmm. So we, we, everything is always going to be reactive. You know, is somebody going to supply Palestinians with, with weapons? Of course not. So Palestinians are always going to be, they're never going to stand a chance. What they do is they do, again, as a reaction to something else. I think that what we need to do, and we means every single person here, and like I said, in every other place that I speak, and where people of conscience sit, we need to work together to start presenting Palestine to the world. You know, we assume we assume that something is going to happen. We assume that this is going to end. You don't know these people, the people that sit in the Israeli government right now. I was writing something, I was talking to somebody about the Holocaust and, you know, is what is happening in Palestine, not the Holocaust, not, you know, we just had the conversation, we're not comparing, you know. And the, 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 the person was saying to me, well, you know, there are no gas chambers and no trains. But the Holocaust didn't start with gas chambers or chain. It started with a person like Ben Gvir. Itamar Ben Gvir was now really yeah. the czar of everything that has to do with Palestinian life. And Vitzel Smotrich, who was the czar of everything that has to do with Palestinian life in the West Bank. These two rabid, radical, racist, hate-filled human, you know, people, that's how it began. It began with Hitler and people following him. It didn't be start with that. So what are Palestinians going to do? Continue to be reactive to these monstrosities, which you well, as you well described, unless, unless we are able to put together something strong enough that can develop a strategy, that can build trust, because right now nobody trusts anybody, that can build the trust that is needed to influence policy here in America, to influence public opinion here in America. And the largest and arguably the most important capital in the world today, there is not a single Palestinian flag flying on any building, not one. Since you mentioned that, I will turn to the, the, uh, the attendees here in a little bit, but uh, uh, I wanted to ask you about the judicial reform and the, you know, all these massive demonstrations and how, you know, uh, how, why the, the gulf that it's creating here in America, especially within the Jewish community, whether that can actually get wider and you know, push people towards beginning to question what Israel does and so on and its role as a, a democracy or non-democracy. Well, I, I don't really have a lot of 
you know, hope or 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 reason to to think that this uh, this opposition to Netanyahu's uh, policies is going to go very far. I mean, we've never seen anything like Israel has never seen anything like this for months. Every Saturday, over a hundred thousand people in Tel Aviv protesting against the government. But I think it's important to understand what they're protesting is absolutely correct. I mean, they need that need to be protests because it's a march to fascism. It's an absolute push to fascism. There's no question. But the context in which they're protesting is because it endangers their right within the apartheid bubble of privilege, you know, and their right to protest. But Here's something very interesting, which tells you a lot about the people involved. There was a time where the Israeli headline, you know, news and Israeli headlines were going crazy because fighter pilots refused to show up for training. Fighter pilots went to the protests. The Israeli fighter, the reservists have to train every week. The reservists. And they show up. They love their work. I mean, they get to bomb and kill as much as they want all the time. They didn't show up for training because they said being part of the protest is more important. Think about that. They never once questioned their training when they were sent to murder thousands in Gaza. Not once. The entire protest when Israel with the last the, what, the last massacre in Gaza, the protest stopped. They were put on pause. No, this is national unity. We all need to look and see the people of Gaza getting murdered, and we all need to give everything we've got to help this effort. And when it was over, everybody went back. This is a level of hypocrisy that is so great that I don't even know if it's, if if it's, if I think it's unprecedented. So I don't really have a lot of hopes. And I think America, I think Jews in America who are kind of interested in these things, I don't Mm -hmm. know that many, but those that are are confused. Right. are confused and they I think if they study this well hopefully they'll be able to yank themselves out of this racist Zionist ideology and find their humanity again and oppose Israel mm-hmm. all right with that I know that the clock is running out so I'm going to turn to the audience and uh, take a few questions uh, I just came back from the region and I saw the- 20- Oh, I'm sorry. I, yes, thank you. I just came back from the region and saw, you know, Father Shakur's village, which is now a national park built over the ruins of the village. And we saw the settlers parading across the Ma- the Temple Mountain, all of that. But I want to ask you in terms of working in Washington, we have this the Israel lobby and they're very intimidating. Um, and the, the censorship of our news also prevents us from building a movement here. Um, and also the attacks on BDS where, you know, in terms of state laws. So how do you Miko, uh, proceed. You know, propose to overcome that wall of opposition. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I should say this. Maybe I shouldn't say this publicly. Um, I have a secret plan. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, seriously. Um, yeah, they're intimidating. But you know, what are they going to do to us? Call us anti-Semitic? They're already calling us anti-Semitic, right? I mean, I don't think we we stand a risk. I think uh, we need to be bold. I think we need to be direct. I think we need to be honest. I think we not we we need to resist the the desire to um, try to reach out to Zionists and always talk about dialogue and always talk about peace and always talk about reconciliation because that's a that's a that's a non-starter. I think we need to focus on Palestine. What is Palestine? The history of Palestine. Ask when people talk about the history of Palestine, what do they talk about? 1948? 1948. Whoever talks about Dahir, Dahir Omar. Dahir Omar. Who talks about Dahir Omar? How many Palestinians even know about Dahir Omar? uh, An incredibly important figure in the history of Palestine who ruled almost all of Palestine throughout the 18th century. Very people people know about him, about the commerce that he created, about the the relations between Palestine and other other, other places. Uh, The city of Lid, you know, who knows? Let me ask you a question. This is kind of off- but it's a, but 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 it's a good little little uh, exercise. Everybody has heard of King David, right? Everybody's heard of Saint George, right? I was sitting in I was actually in Florence. You know, I I, I tour in Italy. I mean, it's you know, you die and go to heaven, right? And it was in Florence, 
And so I got to spend a week in Florence and there was this exhibit, Donatello exhibit. And, you know, I mean, you just... So I'm sitting there and two of Donatello's most important statues, creations are King David, which is a very interesting one, and uh, St. George. And I'm looking at these two. There was a poster that had both of them. What do those two figures have in common? By the way, how many people here are Palestinian? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, yeah. I'm just, just curious. Uh, what do those two figures have in common? Anybody? How are they both Palestinian? King David is from where? King David is from Bethlehem. Where is from, where is King George? Where, where is St. George from? St. George is buried in Lid. The church of St. George in Lid is where St. George is from. He was a Palestinian. These two massive figures of Western culture are both Palestinian. Never mind Jesus Christ. We'll put him aside for just a moment, okay? But these two massive, massively important figures in, 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 uh, in Western culture, they're both Palestinian. Now, who's heard of Lid? Nobody. Nobody's ever heard of Lid. It was a massively important, incredibly important city, historically, in Palestine. It's incredible stuff goes on there now. Talk about apartheid. Talk about all kinds of things. We can talk about that all night. You know, what do people know about the history of Palestine? What Palestine gave to the world? Nothing. Most people don't even know that King David is from Bethlehem. You know, so we need to, so back to your question, but we can do here in Washington, D.C., we need to <clears throat> reclaim Palestine. Reclaim Palestinian history. Because right now, the Palestinian history is nothing, unless you know a little bit about the Bible, maybe, and then nothing for several thousand years, and then, you know, 1948, the Nakba. It's a, you know, that needs to be reclaimed, and then you can explain to people why it's important to have a free Palestine. This period of the Zionist occupation of Palestine is very short historically. Yes. And hopefully it won't go on much longer. Hopefully, not. So now you know what you need to do. You go and post the story all over the place and get some pictures if you can. Yeah, yeah. I, I did uh, it. We I have uh, time for a couple more questions. We'll go there. As you talked about the uh, 1967 war and how the conventional story is certainly not true. Uh, what if you have the opinion about the 1948 war where it said that the Allied... Uh, the Arab armies uh, got together to try to throw Israel to the, into the sea. Uh, but if you look at it, the, of course, the uh, Jordan uh, uh, army just stood in uh, Jerusalem. And the only army really was the Egyptian army. And uh, from my study of it, the Egyptian army never entered into what was given to Israel, to the land of Israel. They only tried to free the land that was taken by Israel and was given to the Palestinians. Uh, and th they would have settled for that. So I if you have an opinion on that. Uh, uh, on the... Yeah, of course. Well, um, well, I mean, I just want to just one thing you said, you know, given the land that was given to Palestinians. Right. It was the Palestinian. The whole thing was the Palestinians. They didn't need to be given anything. Uh, but yeah, of course, the 1948 uh, myth is 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 of course a big part of the problem. It's a big part of this myth that people like so much. Again, the Jewish people returning after two thousand years of suffering and exile to their homeland. You know, first of all, you know, how many Jewish people can trace their their own actual names and families back to two thousand years ago? Not one. Not, yeah. not one. Not one. They'll say, oh, yeah, the Bible. I asked this, and the guy says, oh, the Bible. I said, read the Bible. Your name, show me. Yeah. What are you talking about, the Bible? This whole notion that today all Jews are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews, you know, is questionable at best, and it's irrelevant anyway. Uh, but yeah, that's that's people love that story. They, you know, the Zionists are brilliant with their PR, they're brilliant, you know, and they had actually a brilliant team. I talked about Moshe Sharet earlier. You guys may remember the name Golda Meir. Yeah. My grandfather was part of that. I have a poster at home advertising a lecture by my grandfather in 1922. 
in Kiev, I think, or something. You know, Dr. Abraham Katznelson will speak about, you know, the situation in Eretz Israel. 1922, there were three and a half Jews in Israel in 1922, right? I mean, that's the, the but yeah, but the mythology is powerful. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to make a brief comment. You know, you mentioned something uh, on the aid, American aid to Israel. And it, it's because, yeah, America is the premier colonial power and Israel is really a colonial power. So that, that's why the aid. I mean, the, it, it keeps it, sustains it because it does the work on behalf of the United States of America. I, you know, I, uh, I remember what Ben-Gurion said in 1952 when, uh, when he came right before Truman uh, was leaving office. And he said, we can be the bulwark. We can be the bulwark you know, for, against Arab nationalism, against your interest in the region, you know, against the Soviets and so on. So there is a reason for, for the aid and it will continue. And it's not only the military aid, you know, the, the $4 billion a year, it's a, it's a lot more than that. More than that. I have uh, maybe two more questions. I'll go here first and then we'll come to you because I, I don't like lumping questions together. You know, I, I, I don't do that. So, okay. yeah. So th this is more of a, of a personal question. I was just wondering whether your father ever changed his mind, whether he repented of having um, uh, pushed the country into the 67 war. Um, I, I know that he became um, very, a scholar on, uh, on Palestinian literature. So I'm just wondering how far did he go in terms of, or did he ever rethink any of this? That's a great question. Uh, I, uh, people ask that quite often. It's a very good question. So my father was accused of crossing the line. So during these crucial meetings between the Israeli high command and the prime minister, May 28th and June 2nd, 1967, they called it a general's coup. Israelis call it a general's coup. That's how it's known as a general coup. And he is known as one of the leaders of the general's coup. And actually, I talk about it in the book, he was asked by it many, many times, and he said, nonsense, you know, our job is to advise as strongly as we can, the government has to make the decision. But we as the experts, if we were economic experts, we should have, you know, been advising on economic issues, we were military experts, and that was, so he said, you know, we had to state our case. <clears throat> At the same time, he dedicated the rest of, he retired in 1968, and dedicated the rest of his life to what he thought was could be an Israeli-Palestinian state based on what we know today is a two-state solution, you know? And interestingly enough, he used to come here and speak a lot in America. He knew, you, did you know Lander Bowling? Yes. Yeah, so he knew Lander Bowling would bring him and they were good friends. He could, uh, listen to this, okay? A former Israeli army general of the 67 generation would come here to America to talk but because he talked about the Palestinian issue, because he talked about peace between Israelis and Palestinians, he could not get a meeting with a staffer. He could not get a meeting, and Andrew Bowling tried. People tried. He could not get a meeting with a staffer. You know, he almost met Andrew and Andy Young once, you know, the ambassador to the UN or something. He couldn't get a meeting with a staffer. Today, you know, Bernie Sanders talks about it like he, you know, he he you know, came down with a you know, the Ten Commandments or something. So, I mean, so, but what he did was he thought that that was the way to go. The past is the past, which I think is an absolutely wrong approach, which I reject completely. And we need to talk about two-state solution and we need to talk about reconciliation in that way moving forward. So that's kind of what he did. And uh, personally, like you said, he, he um, within the Zionist context, you know, he did what was possible. But, if you reject the Zionist context as I do, then I think what he did didn't help one bit. You know, it was it was it was completely completely counterproductive. If you ask me what he would say today, I would have to say that today he would completely reject Zionism, and he would call to move forward with an app with a with a secular democratic state from the river to the sea called Palestine. There's no question in my mind that that's what he would say if he was alive today. Last question. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Miko, for coming tonight and speaking to sure. us. Uh, I have a, a question and a comment. Um, I mentor and support a 25-year-old 
a male graduate in Gaza. And we talk a lot. And it keeps me grounded to what goes on on a real daily basis, you might say. And, uh, you know, the recent bombings that uh, Gaza had and, you know, and how he talks about his 25 year old, how he's been robbed of his childhood since 2014. Uh, you know, when that happened, those wars are attacks on Gaza and, you know, how his life is, the poverty level and so forth. But my question is, um, or my, my question is, you know, what can I, I'm not, I feel like I'm at a loss as to what I can further do for him, except support him. And actually, as you said, um, you know, support him by doing things here and educating. I think education is the biggest uh, thing that we can, you know, provide to people. And even within my own uh, church, the Presbyterian, the Presbytery is uh, in their social department to, uh, advocates for support of Palestine. But on, on my own level, um, I spoke to the high level about why they're not receiving this. And it's because they have a couple of reformed Jews in our press, pro, Protestant church that they seem like they're afraid of. And I thought it was interesting that this uh, leader in the social justice called uh, pal, uh, progressive except Palestine, PIP or PEP. And it's so true, but it just makes me want to fight more for them. And you encourage us to do that. And I think that's the only way we're going to, you know, by, by people learning about this and being educated, if you have any hints towards that prospect of educating. Yeah, you know, I have friends in Gaza. Um... And I talk to them every time, you know, Israel decides to bomb Gaza. And this one friend of mine, she's a single mom. She's got this adorable seven, six or seven year old daughter. And, you know, we do the FaceTime and she sends me little video clips of her. And you, it's just, you, you, you feel helpless. I mean, 2014, I was in Palestine and not only 2014, 2021. I was in Jerusalem while Israel was bombing Gaza. I could have been in Gaza in 45 minutes. There's nothing I could do. There's nothing you could do. It's a sense of helplessness that I, so I hear you. I hear what you're saying. It's a sense of helplessness because we're, there's no, we can't do it on our own. You, you can't go up there and stand in front of the, I mean, you can stand at the, you know, at the checkpoint of fence in Gaza and, you know, so what? It's not going to make any difference. They're not even going to arrest you. They won't even bother. Um, but I think there's like I said, there's a serious lacking in in uh, in an organization and a parent organization that will take care of the Palestinian issue. No one's doing it. So individually, we can only do what we can do as an organization that's dedicated just to that, not dialogue, not peace, not just to reclaiming Palestine, just to making sure that every member of commerce and every staff for every single day gets 300 emails about Palestine. And, you know, I was talking to this, the reason I said 300, I was talking to an intern one of the senatorial offices, I forget which office, he's Palestinian. He said that they get 300 emails a day just from Stand With Us. That's yeah. one organization. Right. Three emails a day. Yeah. You know, and I said, how many do you get from Palestinian organization? So, you know, that's, that's, that's the key. That's the problem. And again, like, and you're right, you know, so I, you know, I put out tons of, of material, tons of, of, you know, of uh, content onto social media you know, subscribe to it and share it, you know, share it with people, send it to people, not just me, there's great stuff out there. Uh, I used to with Stanley, who was a great journalist in the UK, just put out a book about weaponizing anti-Semitism. you know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, but I mean, so we need to do things before we share, we need to make sure that we're informed. So we know what we're talking about, because I've seen really good, you know, good meaning activists who were just sorely not misinformed. And when they had to argue with anybody, it was sad. So make sure that we're informed, make sure we know we're, what we're doing, why we're saying what we're saying. And yeah, send them the books, send them the stuff online, send them the podcast. I have a podcast. A lot of other people have great podcasts. There's a lot of a lot of good stuff out there. I mean, Mondo Weiss is great. Um, and whatever people like to do, if they want to read, they can read. If they want to watch a video, if they want to listen to a one minute clip or a 10 minute clip or an hour clip, it's all available. You know, when I put out stuff, I've got a one a one minute version, a five minute version, a twenty minute version, a one hour version, because everybody likes different things. And there's audio for people who are driving, and there's video for whatever. You know, so that's it's all out there. So I think it's important to share that until 
such day that we all decide that we're going to put together something that can act as a parent and can push this issue forward uh, and can send those 300 emails to every congressional and senatorial office and get in touch with the, with the press and force the press to talk about. It. Well, I don't know if I'd call it that, but something like that, perhaps. Yeah. It's got to be something that's, you know, like that. Uh, sure, that would course, be the last question. Yeah, you can't of say no. <laughs> Are you going to give him the mic? His father, sorry, his father uh, made uh, formed a, a party with an Arab, and he was with his non Zionist party with an Arab and was willing to run second to that Arab in the Knesset. I think you should give uh, more credit to your father. I think because he moved in the direction that you were, uh, he really, I think, rep repented what he did in the past and he moved in a completely different direction. And uh, finally, Miku, uh, about uh, studying Arabic, I think somebody who can read Ghassan Kanafani, Aid El Haifa, is good in Arabic. So I, it's my success as a teacher as well. Okay. Excellent. And uh, on that note, thank you, Miku. And uh, you probably know uh, a, a line by the great poet Mahmoud Darwish then. That's when he said that, لِتَكُونَ فِلِسْطِنِيًّا يَعْنِي أَنْ تَكُونَ مُصَابًا بِأَمَلٍ لَا شِفَامٍ Which means to be a Palestinian, you have to be afflicted with incurable hope. So we are you know, we will remain dedicated and we will remain hopeful. Thank you again. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh,